by the year 2030, two thirds of the world will be lacking access to clean drinking water. This is a problem that every single person is going to be dealing with regardless of where they live in the world. When you begin to treat water as a commodity, where the price of the water is dependent on supply and demand, you end up with corporate control of all of our drinking water. I mean, think about it right now. The cost of bottled water is more than the cost of gasoline. When you consider that, you see that water is really the next empire. I moved to Maine a long time ago when I was a small child, but it was a lot quieter then. And so times change, and we understand that times change, but uh, what we certainly didn't expect was a change in our culture and a change in, in just our way of life. Hey, you have a good day. Okay? Yes. Right. You have a good day, and no I, I'll bring it right back. No problem. You'll be right here. No problem. I'm going to be driving slow. We're used to small business development. We're used to farmers. Farmers around here, there were a lot more many years ago, and farmers are small business owners, so that's what we're used to. We're not used to the largest food processing company in the world arriving on our doorstep. Nestle operates in the United States under uh, multiple names, and Poland Springs is one of the Nestle brands. Nestle is one of the largest profiteers from bottled water. They basically come into rural towns and do water mining. It kind of reminds me of Texas and the oil rush in the 1930s. Citizens of Freiburg, Maine, population 3,083, are waging a war on the biggest bottled water company in the world, Nestle. A Swiss corporation with more than three and a half billion dollars in bottled water sales in 2008. Uh, 
I wound up working as an assistant secretary in Bill Clinton's administration. And whenever I went to the developing world, I always found in my briefing books as one of the number one, two, or three national security interests for the United States, it was potable water, drinkable water. Across the United States, surface water, the oceans, ponds, and rivers, are held as part of a public trust. But groundwater falls under a different set of rules depending on the state. Maine operates with a rule called absolute dominion, which was adopted in the late 1800s. Absolute dominion basically means that he who has the biggest pump gets to take the most amount of water, which in Freiburg, Maine, is Nestle. What's happened is that Nestle gets a permit. Uh, none of this is public knowledge unless someone is going down to the courthouse and, and looking through local permits. And so Nestle gets a foot in the community uh, before the uh, local people who are going to be impacted by this water mining even know about it. They are pretty clever. They started looking at what they needed to do within the state, what they needed to do within communities, and they had a long-term plan for this development. They never notified anybody in town. They never published anything about what they were going to do. They just started pumping water. We were mapped out without our knowledge and consent. And land was bought uh, here and there in, in the places they thought there was water. And people in the town went, how did they? We didn't know that was happening. Nestle right now is pulling all this water out for free and selling it at a huge profit. What a great idea. I mean, really. Well, Nestle uh, decided that we'll just come in and take the water. And some of us said, well, wait a minute here. We're not going to let you just take the water. It's our water. If they really were interested in us, they could come into town and really pay taxes. And what we were talking about was a tax at the wellhead so that as this water got packaged, the people of Maine would be paying less than 1% of this fee. And the people in other parts of the country that purchase Poland Spring water would be paying the rest, since they were the beneficiaries of the water that costs Nestle between 6 and 11 cents a gallon to extract and process and package that they sell for 6 bucks a gallon. And Nestle said there was no way they were going to pay anything period, because they say that if we have a fee like that, that they can't survive. That was it. End of discussion. What's happening here in Freiburg is really a microcosm for what's happening all around the world. Nestle and other large water barons are out trying to tie up the rights to water. Why should a rural community's resources, its ecosystem, be drained so that people in the city can drink out of a plastic bottle when their water is just as good for their living? Who controls this resource? Who owns it? And what Nestle is doing in this community, and they're doing it across the state, is defining control. It's all about control. And we may be very sad that we have allowed the control of this water to go out of our hands because of the way it's set up at the present. The people of Maine have spent a lot of money, publicly and privately, to make sure that this water was cleaned up and is clean and will stay clean for generations. I hate to see our water taken the way it is, just taken. The water belongs to the people and the town gets nothing. You think that's a good deal? Activists claim that citizens in small towns like Freiburg are finding it increasingly difficult to fend off Nestle's overwhelming legal resources. We think that a big corporation like Nestle is able to come in with their big city lawyers and locally in communities where there are 
bottling water, uh, they're very powerful. It's a situation where you're highly outnumbered, you're outgunned. The town got their water from those springs for 100 years, but we were told that Nestle did not want the town's water to come from those springs anymore. They transferred the town's water to a deeper water well. And in February of 2004, something happened. All of the people who live in Freiburg Village were without water for a day and a half, but Nestle, they never stopped pumping the water. They had plenty of water while the nursing home had to uh, have the fire department bring in trucks of water. I think it just kind of points out that the citizens come second in this whole thing. It's a corrupted, compromised process. And that's really uh, a big part of the problem. Once you can do this in one place, you can do it in many other places. It sets a precedent. Once you set that precedent, that, that precedent can never be unset. In the future, we're not just going to be dealing with Nestle. And there are other water companies that will be coming because Maine has vast amounts of water. And so if we allow Nestle to define who controls it, then down the road, we're going to have a much tougher fight on our hands. National corporation from away is trying to come into our state and our bioregion and take control over of our water. From California to Michigan to Maine, the Nestle Corporation is currently waging legal battles against communities to secure their local water mining rights. We need to unite and tell them they can't take our water. We want our water back. Make sure Nestle can hear you all. Water is a basic human right. It's necessary for the survival of life on the planet. When you start commodifying the necessities of life in such a way as to uh, make it more difficult for people to gain access to those necessities, you have the basis for serious political instability. As Mark Twain once said, you know, whiskey is for sipping and water is for fighting. And there's going to be a lot of fighting about this before it's done. Every day, America's largest bottled water corporations, Nestle, Coke, and Pepsi, pump millions of gallons of water from the earth, bottle it, ship it, and sell it back for 1,900 times the cost of tap water. It's bad for the environment, it's bad for public water systems, and it's bad for taxpayers. Communities across the country are uniting in a fight to maintain ownership of their water supplies. You will be able to you will be recalled, and you will be replaced if you charter. Do your duty to the people in this town and you live here, and you're responsible to us, not to this corporation. From town hall meetings to courtroom trials, activists are disputing the rights of corporations to sell their town's water. The World Bank places the value of the world water market at $800 billion. That's a huge amount of money. So you can imagine why these huge corporations are salivating over getting into the water market. It's all about the control and ownership of water. If we can't win this battle here in Freiburg, if we can't win it here, then the rest of the United States is going to have a very difficult time winning it.
the issue of climate change has added further impetus to these issues in terms of where does our water come from? Is it going to be there forever? This is a, a, a problem that uh, every single person is going to be dealing with in the next 20 to 25 years, regardless of where they live in the world. Last year, there was a drought in uh, 35 states. When you consider that water supplies continue to be dwindling in certain areas because of changes in the global climate, it becomes imperative that we do everything that we can to protect fresh water supplies for the use by the general public. When private entities have a claim on public water supplies, uh, you run into a, a real collision of uh, moral values against the narrow profit concerns of corporations. You know, in North Carolina, it's hard for us to get used to thinking about dry, parched, cracked earth. But indeed, that was what we were looking at. Things were getting very bad. And by winter, um, it was terribly grim. One of the ultimate ironies was that Pepsi was, of course, continuing with its bottling plant operations. And this was at the height of the drought. They were drawing over 400,000 gallons a day. Bottling municipal water that then they were selling back at the very point we were running out of water. I thought it would make common sense to put a temporary halt on that plant. And they would not stop doing it. Citizens of Raleigh weren't the only ones troubled by the amount of water being bottled during a drought. Well, the city of Atlanta and North Georgia has been experiencing a, a level four, a very severe drought. And we've asked people to cut back on their water usage. People in Metro Atlanta have long thought there was an abundance of water because we're in a green, lush environment and not realized that we're on borrowed time. We should be standing in about four feet of water or five feet of water right now where we're standing. It's at its worst. I mean, really, from, for a sustained period of time. Atlanta had its second worst drought in history uh, the past year, year and a half, and it's affecting the water that we can use. We have severe water restrictions um, that, are, that are placed on us for watering our lawns and uh, car washes and, and things, things like that. What's most upsetting to me is to not, uh, not treat everyone equally. And what I mean by that is, is to have corporations such as Coca-Cola taking water out of the lake while it is under a severe drought and those in the local economy placed under restrictions. The Marietta plant in 2007, it used like 118 million gallons of water. Bottled water companies use a very small amount of the groundwater in the United States. The Drinking Water Research Foundation has done a study to indicate that the bottled water industry is responsible for only 0.02% of all the groundwater withdrawn in the United States. It may be true that they're taking that small percentage, but they're taking it in a very few, very specific places. And many people have linked their overpumping of groundwater with lowered stream levels, dried up wetlands, depleted or decimated fish populations. Bottled water, like other products, obviously has an impact on the environment. But again, bottled water is no different than any other product that might be using water. But beer doesn't come from my tap. And you can't turn on your faucet and get Coke. You can turn on your faucet, though, and get water. And it's free. When Nestle was questioned in congressional hearings about the effects of their pumping on rivers and streams, they testified that the lower water levels had nothing to do with the water they were taking. This is affected by 
dams built by beavers. Is that the result of only your study or studies that are independent of your study? I know of no independent studies, but I'm happy to share our studies. How Actually, many beavers would it take to do that? Uh, I'm not sure how many, okay. how many beavers. <laughs> For 15 years, we have worked hard to make sure that this source is clean and abundant for everyone. And it's pretty phenomenal in the last couple of years. The trash that we're finding out on this river are plastic bottles. Hundreds and hundreds of plastic drinking water bottles. They're making the profit and we're suffering. Know, if they were using it, making a profit, and then putting some of that back towards the lake, then that would be different. They really see water as blue gold, as just a source of profit. They don't see it as a fundamental right, as something essential for people and for nature. It's only a way for them to make a profit. So if it disappears, you know, 10 years down the road, they've made it their profit. Water has really become a resource that we're fast losing. And we're at a spot now where our bodies of water are increasingly fragile and threatened. Falls Lake, Jordan Lake, and we need to be protecting them. And we're not doing an adequate job right now. We really don't have good comprehensive policies in most places to deal with water supply and water quantity. I mean, one of my favorite examples was as Atlanta was facing a water crisis, the governor was going to bring people together to pray for rain. To all Georgians and all people who believe in the power of prayer, we ask God to shower our state, our region, our nation with the blessings of water. They were on the verge of opening a massive artificial mountain of snow so people could s ski in the middle of the summer. Uh, there wasn't any rational, thoughtful, comprehensive policy in place that would say, this is goofy. With companies like Coke, Pepsi, and Nestle so vital to local economies, government officials are often forced to choose between environmental consequences or job loss. Well, this government's not doing anything. I mean, this government's uh, for sale. And so everything's ready to be auctioned off, including the public's right to water. It is not something where you can just sit back and hope that your elected representatives will always do the right things for the citizens. Do we have a right to say what they do with our water when we're the ones that keep buying it? And if we didn't keep buying it, then they wouldn't be producing as much as they are. So we have to look at it on the demand side. Do we need this? Do we need to continue polluting our planet and wasting our money as a consumer. Crisp. Fresh. Drink. Bottled water is the greatest advertising and marketing trick of all time. Drink, drink, drink. We started buying bottled water in a serious way starting at the end of the 70s when Perrier came across the ocean and was introduced to urban markets. It was a niche product. It was really popular with urban professionals. I think at lunchtime, it's a much better drink than some alcoholic drink. And allows you to continue that sociability that uh, alcohol provides uh, without some of the adverse effects that prevent you from doing a day's work that you would otherwise like to do. It came in beautiful green glass bottles, but we weren't walking around down the street swigging from the Perrier bottles. That didn't happen until 1989, when it became possible to put bottled water into lightweight, cheap, clear plastic bottles made of PET, and that changed the market. And the big change came when Coke and Pepsi got into the game. They introduced waters because they saw their market share for sodas dropping. 
They spent hundreds of millions of dollars telling us to drink more water. Drink more water. That it would make us thinner and more beautiful. They associated their products with celebrities, athletes, and models. I can't care And we drank it up to the point where it became an $11.5 billion business in 2007. We've become like big toddlers. We, we've got the nipple to our lips constantly. We constantly need to know that there's something there just for us that we can just throw away. We want everything individualized and personalized and just for us. And we want to not have to wash it or take care of it. We want to just throw it away. And we want it immediately available and convenient. Otherwise, we'll have a fit. So on one hand, you had this tremendous marketing muscle. Um, and on the other hand, you had a complete absence of criticism of bottled water until very recently. And you didn't have utilities who provide municipal water. They, they didn't have their own PR budgets. Uh, they had barely enough money to keep their own systems going. So they were in counteracting this onslaught of, of media, print, and, and TV ads. <laughs> Many of the ads implied that the water was healthier for us than tap water. We don't consider tap water to be an enemy. We don't. Can people typically perceive a difference in taste? I can tell the difference in many bottled waters, just as I can tell the difference between tap water and, and other beverages. You can. Absolutely. You know, you're, you're under oath, but you're... Absolutely. Yeah. We'll give you, I say that with... We'll give your tongue an exemption now. The bottled water industry does not see themselves in competition with tap water. We provide completely different products. We provide something that is actually a portable, that is convenient, that is refreshing, that is pure. They use words pure, which implied that tap water was impure somehow. Pure, pure water. Pure, pure water. Pure, pure refreshing water. Well, we're a very safe product. Safe, 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 safe. That is safe, safe, safe. I think bottled water is a safe, healthy, convenient product. They're always saying their product is healthful. Um, and implying that tap water wasn't. It is much pure, it is much cleaner uh, than many municipal sources. They want to convince people that tap water isn't safe to drink. Again, we, we are not in competition with tap water. Susan Wellington, VP for Gatorade, also owned by Pepsi, says when we are done, tap water will be relegated to showers and washing dishes. I don't, I don't it know. It doesn't sound like she's, she's loving the tap. I would ask her. Well, that's one person's opinion. It's Pepsi's opinion. OK, it's one person at Pepsi's opinion. In 2000, Robert Morrison, CEO of Quaker Oats, which merged with PepsiCo, said, the biggest enemy is tap water. What does that say? Well, you read the quote. I'm here to tell you that as far as the International Bottled Water Association is concerned, we do not consider tap water to be a, uh, our competition. We do not see ourselves in competition with tap water. Except for these one, two, three, four, five people at Pepsi. Many bottled water companies are careful not to disparage tap water because of their reliance on it. In many cases, bottled water is simply municipal tap water. Basically, these companies are taking our water and selling it back to us for a profit. And we think that we're getting something great in return. That it doesn't really seem like you're getting your money's worth if you're simply paying a very high premium to get what you could be getting out of your tap. In doing my research for the article, I went across the street to a food court and over two days asked probably 15 to 20 people that I found drinking Dasani water in the food court, you know, do you know where this water came from? And none of them did. When you buy Aquafina or you buy Dasani water, it's basically your tap water. You're buying water that could come out of your tap and paying a thousand times the price for it. I think what is the case is what you are getting is pure, refreshing water. That's what they would have us believe, and that's what the labels would have us believe. Is it misleading to have a mountain on there when it's coming from the municipal tap? Again, I would, I would let you pontificate on that. 
Despite the mountain range on its label, Pepsi's Aquafina, as well as Coke's Dasani, are both bottled from tap water and not from a natural spring. Only after mounting public pressure did Aquafina agree to print the words public water source on its label. The mountain range remains, and Coke has yet to include this information on Dasani labels. Well, what we found is that the bottled water industry has been less than forthcoming in providing information on what their bottles actually contain. The packaging can have an adverse effect on the original product, which is why it's so important for us to get the information from the bottlers who know exactly what's happening at their plants and who know exactly what is happening in that bottle. I think most of the public does not know that their plastic materials are being made in, in you know, these refineries and petrochemical plants. Beverage containers contain a recycling code on the bottom of the bottle. Bottled water is packaged in PET or PETE, polyethylene terephthalate. The primary ingredient in PET is paraxylene, a clear liquid derived from refining crude oil. Eighty percent of PET manufactured in the U.S. ends up in Nestle, Coke, or Pepsi beverage containers. A number of oil companies in the U.S. manufacture paraxylene, and one of the leading manufacturers is Flint Hills, the largest privately owned oil refinery in the nation, located in Corpus Christi, Texas. This is the first step in the manufacture of PET. That, my friends, is Flint Hills. And that's here in where Corpus plastic Christi. starts. Yes, that's where plastic starts. What they make is paraxylene, which is a, a vital compound in making plastics. What a lot of people don't know is that it's in the benzene family, and benzene causes cancer. So as they're raking in the bucks, the people here are sick and dying. When my sister passed away of breast cancer, I had no idea how much my life would change. At her funeral services, people came up to us and saying, you know, so many people that are her age that lived in our community on the west side are dying of cancer or have had cancer. And after we buried her, after the funeral, we said, remember all the people that came up to us? We said, what if Deanna's death and others didn't have to happen? So we conducted our own investigation, and we found that our community was built on top of oil waste field. That link to the oil industry is what uh, soon after that got us to work with on environmental justice issues by the refineries, because it was all linked to the oil refineries. We don't want people to suffer the way she died. When you think about the finished product of a plastic bottle, you don't think about the process and the headache and the pain and suffering and the health effects that come from living next door. It's out of sight, out of mind. But these are real problems that are being experienced by real people.
Something causes a lot of these neighbors around here to be sick. It's not just me. My, my other two neighbors, they're, 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 they're sick. Anything that not pure air has got an effect on your health. Any anything, and uh, the the air conditioners just bring it right on, right on in the house. His doctor come in and told me, "Say, well, your day's over, son. You ain't never going to work again." He's on oxygen, and um, I have sarcoidosis which is a, a multi-systemic disease, which means it can go into any organ. If you ain't got a good, strong heart and a good, strong set of lungs, then you ain't got nothing. Not only do they need to think of that purchase of that one plastic bottle and what it can do to their health, but by continuing to purchase these, it's just going to keep them in business. So if they stop buying that, it not only protect their health, but people that they've never met, people that are suffering and dying, like here in Corpus Christi. I worked for the state EPA, the state Air Pollution Control Agency, and we were told that we could be fired and terminated if we went and, and tried to inform the community, even if they weren't complaining, that there could be toxic substances in the air, to hand out our cards, that they had a right to complain, that they had a right to clean air, okay, and that we could, if they complained, uh, then we could go in and do investigations, we could write violations, we could take companies into enforcement and make them reduce their pollution. Until people picked the phone up and complained, we were not supposed to agitate the communities. I consider myself to be garbage because garbage is worth nothing, so neither am I. If it wasn't for the love of my wife and my grandchildren, I wouldn't be here because they love me. They treat me with it. What else have what else you left me to do? There's reasons why people that live around these refineries, you know, breathe this air and drink this water, uh, have higher rates of cancer, birth defects, and other illnesses. Overall birth defects in Corpus Christi are 84% higher than the state average. One of the concerns I have with the PET plastic bottles is that you wind up contaminating a lot of groundwater. Most of the petrochemical plants have major chemical leaks in the ground. So part of the toxic cycle of dealing with um, PET is that there's so many uh, problems that it, it contributes to. The groundwater is contaminated, the air is contaminated, the soil is contaminated, but because people don't drop dead on the spot, you don't have to think about it, yeah. you know, so you can get away with it. I think it's the perfect crime. The plant hasn't always been two blocks from us. It's just gradually moved up, little by little, so much so till we just probably didn't pay any attention until we started hearing people talk about emissions in the air and this in the air, and then we became conscious of it, and now we're very aware of it. People say, well, you're silly to live next to a refinery. But when we came in here, you know, we were younger and we were excited that we found a house. And I taught at the school and it was right across the street from the school. But now, in retrospect, I, I would like to move. But we live so close to the refinery, I think it would be very difficult to sell our house.
You know, there's battles that you, you can fight and win, and there's battles that you can start and you lose. This is a battle that if I started, I'd lose. A man like me can't go against Clint Hill. When we, as a society, don't protect the most vulnerable, then we leave our, our full nation open to vulnerability. When people buy bottled water that's made with PET, they are contributing to these sacrifice zones and to the toxic exposures that people here are suffering with. Even though it may be uh, people who are um, living on the fence line, ultimately it affects everybody because, because ultimately we all pay. As long as bottled water is being presented as safe, we will all be affected ultimately and eventually. We don't know what the long-term consequences are to this type of exposure. So people think when they're drinking bottled water that they're getting a healthy product. They're not conditioned to think, well, maybe there's something in the plastic. And then we trust government, uh, we trust industry. Uh, when they say that everything's okay, we say, okay, sounds good to us. Our product is safe. The package is safe. I don't see any long-term effect presented by our package. Our members are meeting the standards of the FDA. The problem is, is that to our last account, we found that uh, one person at the FDA was responsible for overseeing all of the regulation of bottled water in the country. Are you that one person? I do some, spend some of my time on bottled water, but I have other responsibilities as well. It doesn't sound right that there'd be one person at all of FDA, but who knows? The FDA is filled with good people who are trying to do their best, but they are overwhelmed. The drug industry is so big, so powerful, so rich, the FDA can't keep up, and their hands are tied. There's a huge difference between the regulation of tap water and the regulation of bottled water. Um, to put it simply, tap water, municipal drinking water, is highly regulated, and bottled water is virtually unregulated. I don't think you would ever find a situation where a bottled water would not be subject to FDA regulation. If it's produced in Maine and sold within Maine, it's not under FDA jurisdiction. We regulate products that are in interstate commerce. That means products that move from state to state. Most bottled water is produced in state and consumed in the state. And the FDA does not have control over those types of bottled water. Is it true that the bottled water maker is the one that does their own testing and then submits their reports to you? Bottled water manufacturers have to do their own testing on their own products and on their own sources. But the bottled water company isn't required to submit a regular report to you, correct? No, they are not required to. Every city provides a public water quality report that you can access online anytime. Bottled water companies are not required to make their reports available to the public. Those tests can stay hidden in company filing cabinets, they can stay and, you know, back up hard drives at bottled water companies. They don't have to be published. We've actually tried to use our Freedom of Information Act to get some of that uh, data, and uh, the, the FDA is very reluctant to honor citizens' organizations' FOIAs uh, at this time. Could you imagine what it would mean to the industry if something went wrong with any of these products? So they want to make sure that they're as pure as possible. Something's gone wrong many a time. Now, there have been many recalls. With water? Yeah. OK. I've, I've never heard of any. 
The U.S. Food and Drug Administration is recalled. Bottled water that may be when we find out that there's something in our tap water that shouldn't be there, it's because it's constantly being tested. Tap water is regulated under the Environmental Protection Agency. And the EPA actually has health standards to which each municipal water provider is held. Municipalities have to test it many, many times a day. In a city, over a million has to be tested 300 times a month. In a city of three million and more, it has to be tested 400 times a month. So who are you going to go with? Half of one person at the Food and Drug Administration telling you that these billions of bottles of water are safe? Or you're going to go with municipalities who are testing the water many, many, many times a day? Who do you trust? When you're talking about the bottled water industry, you're talking about virtually no testing. And people have just assumed that what we're getting is safe. So we tested over a 1,000 bottles of water and found everything from arsenic to leaching from plastic bottles to bacterial contaminants. And really, what we learned from this was that you really don't know what you're getting. Some people have gone to drinking bottled water literally because they are concerned about the water. And the problem is they're unaware of the fact that buying bottled water would not, is not necessarily safe, that you end up being exposed to other chemical compounds. Testers over the years have come up with all kinds of contaminants in bottled water that we wouldn't have found out about if people hadn't taken upon themselves to, to run the tests. In an independent test of bottled water, we sent seven brands to two separate labs. One to test America, and the other to Dr. Michael Summer, an environmental chemist. Then, to ensure there'd be no bias, Dr. King, an epidemiologist and toxicologist with Toxicology, Inc., analyzed the results. If you were to look at all the data I brought and you read everything, you'd be horrified horrified at what they found from, you know, vinyl chloride to butadiene to styrene, benzene. I mean, it's horrifying. The first group of bottles were tested straight off the shelves. Test America found in their analysis of the samples toluene. A toluene is a constituent in gasoline and it has been used in paint thinners. It's um, a neurotoxic agent and is also linked to adverse reproductive outcomes. The second group was left in the trunk of a car for one week. Dr. Michael Summer tested some water samples from five different bottles and identified styrene in one of the samples. Styrene is a cancer-causing agent and can cause adverse reproductive effects. Dr. Summer also found three different types of phthalates. Phthalates can cause a dysfunction, particularly in the fetus and can cause uh, adverse reproductive outcomes for males and females. It really concerns me when I see mothers blindly trusting bottled water and handing their children bottles of water, putting their complete trust in a product without so much as questioning, what am I giving my child? Yet we're putting so much faith in this industry that's completely self-regulated and that hasn't been held accountable by anyone. It's frightening. While single-serve bottles of water are made of PET, five-gallon water jugs are made of polycarbonate plastic, the primary ingredient being the controversial bisphenol A. Bisphenol A is the building block molecule that plastic that is hard and clear is made out of. And from this polycarbonate plastic, bisphenol A leaches, gets into the water. Bisphenol A may be one of the most potent toxic chemicals known to man. BPA is found in many products, including sports bottles, baby bottles, and water coolers. The problem is, 
bisphenol AX at very low doses as an estrogen. The recent controversy over BPA started when members of the scientific community questioned the methodology of earlier studies. All regulatory agencies around the world are based on a concept from the 16th century. That is, the dose makes the poison. More is worse. That is not true for any hormone. We tested a dose 25,000 times lower than what anybody had ever tested, and we found that it profoundly damaged every single part of the male developing mouse reproductive system. After a decade of research on low-dose exposure to BPA, Dr. Frederick Wamsall's findings captured the media's attention. His work, corroborated by other independent scientists, led the Senate to investigate the FDA. The media has reported that the federal government's reluctance to regulate these chemicals is based on the reliance of biased studies from the chemical industry itself. Now, I have to tell you, if that's true, doesn't that cast amazing doubt on the ability of the regulatory system to actually protect the public? Senator, at, at FDA, all of our products that we approve are based on data that are prepared and conducted in studies by that particular manufacturer. You, all you do is just rely on what, what a study that comes from the industry itself? It's, it's a disgrace. They didn't get it right with Vioxx. They're not getting it right with bisphenol A. And um, there's going to be hell to pay over this. Senator, we have looked at all the studies in the literature, and there are hundreds. The Food and Drug Administration did not look at all the evidence. They looked at two studies produced by the chemical industry and made their decision on that basis. Have you asked for studies from independent sources? We don't normally ask for independence. Then you don't protect the American people. The National Institutes of Health reviewed 700 peer-reviewed published studies on bisphenol A. 38 internationally recognized scientists said, we are extremely concerned about the impact of this on human health. It happens over and over again that regulatory agencies are captured by the industries they regulate. And certainly the Food and Drug Administration, especially the food branch, is one that has really been in the food industry and the packaging industry's pocket for many years. We've got to start to, to do what we're supposed to do, not what uh, the industry always asks us to do. you have any response? None. Think everything's OK? There is virtually no major human health trend over the past 30 years that has an increase, such as childhood diabetes, that is not related to exposure to this chemical. We find it relating to obesity, breast cancer, to prostate cancer, diabetes, brain disorders, such as attention deficit, hyperactivity disorder, liver disease, ovarian disease, disease of the uterus, low sperm count in men. We're talking about $7 billion a year industry. They will spend any amount of that $7 billion necessary in advertising to the American public, trying to convince them this chemical is completely safe. The scientists who work for product defense companies will never produce a study, or certainly will never publish a study, that finds a result that the sponsors don't like. Because their job, their whole economic model, is based on working for the companies to protect their products. Walmart has taken the initiative to remove this type of packaging from their shelves. They've been called more stringent than the FDA. How do you respond to that? I, I appreciate that you want information about BPA, and I'm sure FDA would be happy to respond, but I'm not the appropriate person to, to answer those questions. My concern is that the FDA doesn't want us to ask about BPA because of the current That's investigation. Um, Can you talk about it now? No. If I had known you were going to talk about that, 
probably wouldn't have given you the interview. Bisphenol A is so frightening to the regulatory community because of the magnitude of the error they made. And bisphenol A is the poster child chemical that is going to dismantle the entire regulatory process and demand a reanalysis of all chemicals. Of the 80 million single-serve bottles of water Americans consume daily, 30 million of them end up in landfills. The average world recycling rate on beverage containers is 50%. The United States falls behind that world average with a rate of around only 20% of all beverage containers actually getting recycled. This number has been on a steady decline year after year. It's, it's important, I think, to make it known that 100% of bottled water containers are recyclable. And we do encourage... Well, they are recyclable, but they're not being recycled. Not all of them. It's just because there isn't enough recycling capacity. There's not enough collection. The charge to provide safe drinking water in the whole country really comes down to municipal officials. And they spend an awful lot of money to provide a safe product. And they're competing then with the bottled water company, and in some cases feeling a little bit under attack by the bottled water folks. And then at the back end, after you know they go through this sort of insulting, our water isn't as good as your water kind of thing, then the municipalities are meant to pick up the tab by providing all the recycling for the plastic bottles. Well, why not put some of the recycling costs onto the bottled water industry then? What a good idea. That's exactly what container deposit legislation or container deposit systems do. Only 11 states offer container deposit legislation, also known as bottle bills. That's when consumers pay a small deposit on the bottles they purchase and get that deposit back when they return it for recycling. That funding is what funds the entire recycling program. It's completely in the hands of private industry. So not only is it not relying on taxpayer funding, but they're not worrying about the volatility of government funding to pay for the program. In states that have a five cent deposit, they get about a 70% return rate. In Michigan, where they have a 10 cent deposit, they get a 97% return rate. It really is a proven system. It's been in place in most of these states for 25 or more years, and we know it works well. A lot of states don't have bottled water covered in their systems because bottled water didn't exist 25 years ago when they passed their bills. Of the 11 states that have bottle bills, only six of them have expanded to include bottled water. Most of the states that have bottled bills, they only cover soft drinks and beer. And so when bottle bills, when it comes up to expand them, they send their lobbyists in. They spend millions of dollars fighting those bills. Because we think it's an unnecessary tax uh, on the American consumers. What we'd like to see is actually more street curbside um, pickup. Uh, curbside recycling is uh, the preferred method and can be very effective. And we're trying to do everything we can to encourage consumers to recycle. The companies say that they support curbside recycling. They think this is the best way to get the bottles back into recycling systems. They are really resistant to deposit programs. They don't like the idea of this because it's bottlers that fund this. They end up paying a penny or two per bottle after all their uh, costs are, are figured in and, and the money they make by recycling the plastic. They're costly. The retailers don't like them. Um, we think that we can be more effective if we use curbside recycling. What happens is people don't have access to curbside recycling. How many people don't have access? About half. 50% of Americans can't recycle. Don't even have curbside one. recycling, that's right. And of course, with bottled water, this is one of those products that is consumed on the go. So people don't bother to bring it all the way home again and put it in their recycling bin. It's just not convenient enough for them. If one-third of their products are not being consumed at home, then that means that's one-third that has no chance of making it to the recycling bin. And that's 56 billion containers. That's an awful lot to just give up. 
the plastic bottle usually ends up in the landfill, but some gets incinerated. A lot of it ends up in the Pacific Ocean. It's a bother to people. They're not taking the time. They don't have the space to keep it around until they can get it to a recycling center or to the landfill. When it rains, all that plastic is mobilized, goes down the streams, into the rivers, and down to the sea. That's why we're seeing so much of it in the environment. We've been driving for about three hours trying to get to Camillo Beach, which is really the southernmost beach in the United States, and it's where a way is. When you throw something away, it might be out of sight, out of mind to you, but this is where it ends up. Of the 80 million bottles of water we drink in the United States every day, many of them make their way to the sea, where they're carried by ocean currents and end up deposited on some distant shore. This is the constituents of sand now. Instead of being coral and shells and rock, it's plastic. This is the beach of the future. This is what we are going to recreate in if we continue to pollute the environment with plastic. Future geologists, when they take core samples and they come to the 20th and 21st century, they're going to be finding a layer of plastic. And in areas like Camillo Beach, it will be the deepest of anywhere on Earth. If you eliminate the scourge of bottled water, you'll be eliminating one of the biggest problems facing our environment. I was a chemistry major at UC San Diego, and seeing the way our ocean was deteriorating and before my eyes, living right next to the bay where I grew up, I noticed that the water was not the quality that it was when I was a kid, and I wanted to find out more about it. So I started getting involved in the study of water quality, and I got my captain's license. Uh, and became a skipper of an oceanographic research vessel. And since 1995, we've been conducting oceanographic research all the way from Australia to central California. So we've been focused most recently in studying the North Pacific gyre and the accumulation of plastic debris there. Net, small net, where's the, where's the black net? I need the black net. In the Central Pacific, we've discovered an area called the Eastern Garbage Patch, which is twice the size of Texas and has as its constituents uh, a huge soup of plastic. All our trash has been accumulated from Asia and the west coast of North America. And get that orange thing right there by you. These phenomena that we're seeing here are repeated in the North and South Atlantic, South Pacific, and in the Indian Ocean. And uh, we're just now getting a handle on how much is out there. Well, what we do is we go out to this gyre and we trawl a net. It just so happens that when we pull in that net, 
more than finding the plankton in the ocean, we're finding plastic. And so what we see here in this jar is a one mile trawl out in the middle of the ocean, as far from land as you can get anywhere on earth. And instead of it being clear ocean water with ocean animals, it's a plastic soup with more plastic than plankton. In 1999, we did a survey and found six times as much plastic as plankton. In 2008, we went back and did the exact same survey and found 46 times as much plastic as plankton. Our trash is filling up the ocean, turning it into a plastic soup, and those plastic particles are poison pills for the millions and millions of fish and invertebrates that are eating them. So you're actually finding the remains of water bottles in these Oh, samples. absolutely. They're going into the most common fish we have out in the ocean, the lantern fish. They're consuming these plastic fragments that are these smaller sizes. We don't know how much plastic it's going to take to kill these fish, but I can tell you, uh, so far, the most we've found has been 26 pieces in one fish. What you have is a gradual decline of the health of both us and the marine species. The green plastic watering can For a fake Chinese rubber plant And a fake plant Water may have a place in disaster relief, but there are issues around bottled water that make it unsuitable for regular use. And those issues need to be emphasized because bottled water is becoming a big contaminant of our environment. All these contaminants have resulted in a ocean which is compromised. This is an immediate threat now. This is threatening the entire marine food web. I do believe that meaningful change occurs from the bottom up. So if you get enough people upset and angry and willing to do something about it, I do think you can make a change. There is no law in any book, even Homeland Security. I'm just very stubborn, I'm very persistent, and I think that those qualities have kept me going even in the face of all these intimidation tactics. When you feel like living, you got to stand up and take a look away, look away to the sky But it, it doesn't really scare me, it just makes me angry, and it's like, Hell no, I'm not stopping. I'm just angrier and I'm gonna fight even harder. Keep on dreaming, boy, cause when you stop dreaming, it's time to die. So Dow Chemical asked us, can we arrive at a mutually beneficial outcome where you delay publishing this paper until approved for publication by the chemical industry? Now, we took that as an attempted bribe. When we told him, in no uncertain terms, what he could do with his offer, he switched tact and started saying, we want you to know how disturbed the chemical industry is by the work you're doing, and uh, it made us mad. And that was a mistake. I had uh, probably pissed off the people at the top of my agency. They were very unhappy about what I had done. Uh, but, you know, I was trying to use the law to protect public health, which is the way the agency is supposed to work, not protect the company, the polluter. I could see that the agency was just too much manipulated by uh, special interests through the oil industry and the petrochemical industry. So in 1992, I quietly left. Not so quiet now. <laughs> For some reason, we've begun to take clean drinking water for granted, and that's a mistake. There needs to be a voice 
for the environment and the long-term interests of the community to protect and enhance this vital resource. We should be strengthening our public water system and enforcing the laws to make sure that our water is clean. It's important in a democracy that people stand up for things. Democracy is a participatory sport. By selling our water to this multinational corporation, the district is putting all of us at risk. There is no such thing as extra water. We're here today uh, preparing for a vote to ban bottled water, but not just to ban the provision and sale of it, but we're going to reinvest in municipal water infrastructure. We need to invest in our water infrastructure and stop the promotion of bottled water. When we drink bottled water, we're telling our leaders that we don't care about the tap water. Hope in the town of Babylon is the Kick Your Water Bottle campaign will filter from the office to the community. It is convenient to have a bottle of water to carry around, but why not have your own bottle? And supporters of these measures argue you're better off just filling a reusable container at the water fountain for free. You don't have the same huge environmental downsides of billions of bottles going into the environment. The environment is everything. It's where we live, work, play, worship, go to school. Show yourself. Take only what you need from it. The state is talking about expanding the state bottle bill to include non-carbonated bottled beverages. The state's bigger, better bottle bill just may soon become law. This is about taking steps to protect our state's environmental future. It's time for the legislature to pass the Bigger, Better Bottle Bill. It's essential to expand the bottle bill in order to help reduce litter and to generate some much-needed revenue for New York State. The water is warm, but it sent me shivers. Is it not one of the most important issues that we're facing today? This is really the battle about the future. Baby boomers have got to stand up and wage this fight. And they've got to stand up and wage this fight for their children and their grandchildren. More and more places are banning bottled water. A growing number of cities are banning the use of public money to buy bottled water. Vending machines in municipal buildings no longer offer bottled water. The restaurant now serves only filtered tap water. Washington University in St. Louis will end almost all sales by the end of this semester. We've had successes, and I think we will continue to have some successes, but it is David fighting Goliath. We are the children of Revolutionary War soldiers, and we are not going to give this up without a fight. We are not giving it up without a fight.